might pass it over to you, Don Rose. Okay, so um, then let's start with what do we want to look into? So today we want to get a better understanding about the type of difficulties that students experience while compiling their doctoral thesis research proposal. And we were asking people to hand in already prior to the webinar, some questions and challenges that they do have. And basically what we have been receiving were topics alongside five challenge areas which start out with a lack of clear guidance on what actually to do, which is by the end not a surprising thing, but we might want to, to look into what is it exactly that is lacking here in the guidance. Then the identification of a suitable research topic and literature gap, both of those um, came in as being a frequent struggle, so how do I as well understand what is a gap, what is a gap in the literature, um, and how come, do I come from there to a suitable research topic? And thirdly, as Jack already mentioned, um, understanding about what a research problem constitutes in the first instance. And this is, this is a challenge that students often only understand in hindsight, so that um, only once at that point, once I understood this is a research problem or this is an understanding of a problem, only then they understand, oh, I was focusing actually in the past only on how can I get to something that works rather than how do I understand why things are not working, which is a very different thing. And then determining the best time to stop searching and reviewing literature, and that is, is a challenge that, as a matter of fact, uh, can stay with you throughout your entire thesis duration, because there's an endless amount of literature. Um, so you could continue reading uh, forever, and obviously that's not leading to neither a research proposal being finished nor a thesis being finished. And the fifth one is to align the research problem, the research question, and the outcome expectations, which is something that, again, students often only understand in hindsight, that that was a reason why they were not able to lay out a clear research proposal. Um, and obviously, if you do not understand what a research problem is, or what your research problem is, then it's quite difficult to ask um, a focused research question. And likewise, if you are strongest on your outcome expectations, because you know exactly what you would like the situation to be, then you can ask any question very specific um, that would bring you towards that end point, but not um, to the research problem. So those were five questions that we collected or five areas of questions that we collected beforehand. And as I said, you will have the chance to send in any further questions that you would like to discuss today um, through the chat or by raising them through the voice format. And so with this, Jack, do you want to moderate over the first question on the lack of a clear guidance on what yep, Okay, did you want to head on? So we have several exercises, I suppose is the way to put, if you'd like to go through. Um, the first one is the lack of clear guidance on what to do. Uh, was there another slide on this one, Andres? Um, we, we do have some, for each of the challenges, we do have some slides that afterwards okay. will um, right. showcase the type of challenges faced, but perhaps we could um, ask first for each of the challenges in the round. Mm -hmm. do, yep. do you feel well guided? Is guidance an issue in composing your research proposal? Or do you see that you are excellently guided either through your supervisor or through guides that you found? So is that a challenge that you experience in your 
research proposal um, drafting. Right. We had one comment in the chat is that the research questions and research methodologies are a pain. Um, yes, we will come to it. We, yes. we, we will come to that. Yes. Um, so has anybody had any views on the, the guidance they've received through the supervisors or the university or alternates? So then on a person. Yep. On a personal side, I actually had the university was a bit, um, I suppose, how do you politely put it? Um, There's a whole series of questions they put us through, but then uh, what we actually found at the end of it, uh, quite a, a number were very solution focused rather than the research focus. So you really then had to recut them again. So that did make a difference on that. And you only really realised that when you started to go for the um, ethical approval. That's when it became quite evident. Okay, so some of the few of the uh, general guidelines. Um, Andres, so are I heading you to that or we're covering this off together? That's, so I, I think putting a research proposal together from a structural perspective, um, there are well outlined guides that walk one through, but at many universities, it's, it's left perhaps intentionally quite vague on what a research proposal should constitute or also which structure it should have. Now, as a general guidance, perhaps it's seen to be a roadmap and it outlines the steps that you will be taking throughout the execution. And you will review some assumptions and claims from the literature that others have made. So there, a struggle often comes already in, but we have set as another challenge later. And you should outline a central question that the research will be looking at. And as much as with the literature, that is endless. Um, so you're not expected to reproduce all the previously done work, but just what is relevant. And so it's an initial statement and it, it usually has a clear structure, which is a mirror actually of the structure of any, um, any research work. So it starts with the initial information about the background of the problem, then a brief review of the literature and then you present the research methodology. And structure-wise, if you look across universities, you will always find the same steps or the same outline, whereby introduction, literature, review, and methodology are covered across different titles. In this case, you have here title statement of the problem, background of and history justification of the problem. So this is all introductory. And then you have the literature review followed by the methodology. And again, this is from another guide, which is following the same logic of introduction, literature review methodology. So this framing might help you and provide you with some guidance on what to cover and from there to build. And I think what is very important for you to have as an understanding at that point in time is that the thesis proposal is a living document as much as research is something that develops. Um, so is the thesis proposal. I mean, at the moment that you will hand in your research proposal to the faculty, it will be outdated because your knowledge about the research area emerges on a daily basis, and therefore um, it's always updated, it's, it always will be shaped. So it's a living document that today will look very different than yesterday. And Miguel, research question and research methodology are likewise emergent and will change over time. If you take a new piece of literature, find some related research. That research will come with any earlier methodology 
applied to carry out that research. And therefore you potentially could use such research methodology also within your research. Because you're not expected to make up your research methodology from scratch, but to derive it, it's like one plus one is two. The two is derived from the one plus one. Likewise, the research methodology is derived from earlier studies that you have been looking at. Um, because those studies will come with methodologies that have been put in place, methodologies that have been used. So it will be clear how they have been used. Did they work out? Often those methodologies also come with questions, questions that were looked into and questions that were answered in full or in part. So this will guide you on the type of questions that you still need to ask rather than wanting to ask, like what is already answered and what is still not known. So this type of guidance, you will get exactly over the earlier studies that you can identify. Um, Jack, was this? Yeah, um, actually, just on that last line on the last slide, um, mm -hmm. having a group of like-minded uh, co cohort members, I suppose, pulling together a writing group is really holding yourselves to account and help each other through. Uh, that does make a huge difference. Um, I've done that through mine. And by having that, it is definitely lonely at times, but having that social activity of um, being able to bounce ideas off, look at drafts of each other's, it does make a huge difference and it gets everybody moving along. Sorry about that, Andres, your next I, slide, I think please. That's, that's, that's a very valid point because uh, the, the doctoral journey often is a very lonely journey. And you are absolutely right. If you, if you can hook up with others, and connect and stay in discussion that's invaluable and therefore writing groups um, can be a value, valuable support mean in, in doing so. Absolutely. Because what you find is if one person can't find a particular um, articles, one of the others may be able to. Uh, and having access to different libraries does make a big difference as well. Yes. Uh, and it's just keeping that prompt to keep each other going. So guess that motivation piece happening. Okay, and what was our uh, next exercise, Andres? So then, okay, so <laughs> there you go, Jack. The next one was about uh, identification of a suitable research topic and literature gap. Um, but one, is there any comments on being able to find the suitable research topic and how to hone it in and narrow it down? Uh, and see whether there's actually a literature gap itself. Is anyone managing to identify a research topic? Has anyone faced challenges with finding that mysterious literature gap? Um, anyone? Okay, then. Let's look into it. Let me just make one or two comments. Kashi, did you want to say something? Yes. In the of identifying stable research topic and literature. You know, I think it's one of the major challenges, actually. You're trying to get your thesis up and going. What the method I use with my supervisor is that Initially, the topic are submitted. We will try to, you know, uh, take it up in Google Scholar. The topic has already been uh, severally done in different places. So we feel like it wasn't original enough to go ahead with that topic. So it asked me to go back and uh, look at the topic again and see how I can, you know, come up with something better. So it, it was actually very difficult. It took me, you know, five different uh, versions before finally we were able to get, up, get, up, get something that we fed our original, because some of the key words that we finally used for the topic, we couldn't find it on Google Scholar, we were trying to put it on Google Scholar. So that was how we were able to get the, the topic that was approved after several you know, versions and uh, alterations and corrections and comments. So it's actually one of the major issues in uh, you know, trying to come up with a, a, in a research project, the topic. 
because it's from the topic as I'm going to get a problem, which is actually the major issue also. Because without a problem, there's no thesis. The problem is actually the main, the main issue of a thesis. Without a problem, there's no thesis. Actually, also from that topic, you're able to get a, you know, a, a problem that you're going to solve from your, your thesis. Also, the topic was going to guide you on kind of literature you're going to search. Your literature is also another big issue because it's a literature you're going to get a gap. They're trying to close. They'll help you solve the problem in the research uh, in thesis. So it's a big issue, but it's also, it's also highly surmountable. If, if, if you persevere, if you're disciplined, if your supervisor is able to guide you properly, then you should be guided. Actually, you should be able to come out, come out of it. It's a major, it's a big challenge, actually. It's a very big challenge. Because the topic I went in with, when I, in, my, in my admission process, it wasn't the topic I'm, I'm working on today. It was, it was totally removed. But what I submitted initially as my proposal for admission, it's not, it's not what I'm working on now, it's my thesis topic. It, but it's not how related. So that's how, how difficult it is to get, you know, get a research topic in, in, at this level. Thank you. And I think a catch is this, what, what you're experiencing is exactly typical and representative actually for any, almost any student and in particular in the social sciences um, that is starting because you're given the freedom, be it fair or not, to work out and shape your own research. And therefore, you also are expected to identify a research problem. Now, this is very challenging in, in, indeed. And so how do you get to that research problem? How, how, how do you find it? That's, that's, that's the first thing. And the second then is how do you understand that there is a literature built? Now, I mean, if you take the concept of a gap, that means something is missing. Um, and we had a round table discussion with Professor Dr. Bostian and Professor Dr. Stephen and myself and Jack a while ago, exactly dedicated to that. Um, how do you come to that gap? And now, first of all, everywhere where you have a knowledge gap, you potentially will be able to afterwards find a literature gap. Because gaps are not mysteriously, they, they are just the end of knowledge. Uh, from a certain perspective. So it's either from the perspective of the knowledge that you are holding, uh, the knowledge that I'm holding, the knowledge that your supervisor is holding, and the knowledge that your supervisor was ending up submitting into journals, and thereby it becomes literature. Um, so you can get quite concretely into the direction of finding such gap exactly over the research problem, which is something that is still not understood. If there's a problem, that means it needs to be overcome. So um, therefore the likelihood is great that the problem is associated with any sort of literature gap or knowledge in the literature that is limited. Are others experiencing also challenges? Yeah. As, and just as, also as, adding to that, which, uh, thank you, Miguel, um, rather than purely um, Google Scholar, he was saying he also uses the IEEE, Spring Link, um, Elsevier, Science Direct. So there's so many different um, databases to actually be able to search across. And that does give you a really good depth to work with and you get a lot of research through that way as well. Yes. So did anybody else have anything they want to make comment about the any uh, suitable research topic or literature gap they've been had problems with or comments on? Yeah, how are you? Good day. How are you going? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I also have the same challenge when it comes to identification of a suitable research topic. Uh, you can come up with a research topic, you present it to a professor, looked at it, and it's like, no, this one, we cannot work with this. You have to go back to the drawing board and choose another topic. So it has been uh, like uh, up and about looking for a topic which this professor is not uh, satisfied about it. So I think we need to, to get to understand fully what are we looking when it comes to a research topic? What do we dig into so that we come up with a, a relevant topic for us to research on? I believe that 
everything that we want to research has already been researched. There are some researchers who came before us and everything in the, is in the literature review. So for us as a new researchers, what is it that we're supposed to do to make sure that we come with a different uh, or maybe a unique research topic so that we can present to the professor. So for me, I also have a challenge when it comes to identification of a suitable research topic. Thank you. And Asha, I, I love that observation and very well said. Uh, I mean, in, in, a, in a world with that many human beings, how likely is it that we still find for so many doctoral students unique research problems that are totally new lens. Um, I mean, this is perhaps a starting point. Um, so you need to understand that you only will look at a very, very, or will manage to find a very, very, very tiny problem area that perhaps might still not be understood. So this is a, the first thing. Now, if, if that is anyway how it is, then students don't need to be very creative on finding a big research problem that never has been tackled, like starving. People are, humans are starving. Why and now how can we feed humans? Now, how can we is already the wrong question because that looks at a solution. You could start with why are people starving? So this brings you to a subset. But from what you said, there are two things that, that supervisors often tell students and that cost students valuable months afterwards. The first advice that the supervisor gives is go back to the drawing board. Now, which means you are exactly doing that. You get back to the drawing board. And the second advice is go and read the literature, which again puts you reading the literature. I would argue that none of the two um, is well geared towards helping you identifying a research problem. What would be well geared is continue talking with me and Jack and Ying Deng and Akashi for an hour or two or three and tell us what you do not understand. Why don't you understand your research area or why don't you understand why this is not working? And as we go along and as you will explain that to us, you quickly will get down to a research problem that potentially is researchable. And at that point in time, you could ask for literature to provide you with further information and knowledge. And over there you go, if that makes any sense. Thank you. Uh, for Yang, we actually have identification of a suitable research topic is the most challenging step for me. Especially how to link the topic you need with the interests of the professor, and also how to design the methodology or laboratory procedures. What is exactly, uh, what is exactly ex exit in lab and what you desire may be different in mo most cases of what exists in the lab and what you may design are quite different. I mean, the beauty if you do lab-based research is that you're provided with given boundaries, the machine, the fluids, whatever you have in the lab. So those are the boundaries. Now, if you then have the research interest of your professor, he wants something. Um, so why, why isn't he doing that? There must be a because, because something is not there. If it's just time is not there, that's not a research problem. But if the because is because something is unknown, there you go. Dig further into that, and the likelihood is great that after a day or two, you have a research problem suitable for a first draft for your research proposal, if that makes sense. Check. Back back to the yes. Okay, so do we have any other um, concerns or uh, areas you'd like to discuss about our research topic or literature gaps? Uh, yes, please. Yes, Marla, please. Yeah, yes. I'm only finding difficulty to um, confining or making more more specific. I'm all. Most of my question is generalized question, which is 
make me in difficulty to find a specific methodology. And I feel like I'm going around the literature and I become more, um, I found very difficult to confine my question or to make it more specifically. Do you have any recommendation to avoid that? Uh, perhaps perhaps one, one thing at a time, that would be an, a recommendation. One, one thing that one thing at a time means you first outline what what is the research problem. So what what do you do, what do you don't understand in simple words? Then from there you come with a question: What do you don't understand? And then you talk to search engines about who has been carrying out which studies that could answer the question that you have. And once you come to that point, you will have identified methodologies that those studies used to carry out the research. And those are the methodologies that you potentially could be using. Now, this is a free flow approach, one step at a time. If, however, your faculty has possibly preferences on methodologies, then obviously you need to ask who has been researching this problem and asking this question against the background of this type of methodology used. And then again, you will quickly get related studies and they can inform you on how to shape your own research project. Does it make sense, Marla? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Welcome. So not much creativity is required to find a research method. Because the saying goes, the research method will lend itself to you. So it's the other way around. It knocks at your door. Once you found the related studies, you will understand which type of methods to be used. If you had two related studies that had two different methodologies, how would you choose between the two? The question is, would I choose between two or perhaps apply both? Because you also could be. And if you need to decide, because perhaps uh, within the scope of time, it's not possible to apply both. Then again, it shouldn't be you who decides about it, but the knowledge, like what remains to be unknown. This study has provided this answers and findings, and this study has provided this answers and findings. So is, is there anything still unclear? If there's still something unclear, then you might use the methodology from that study where things, is un things were still unclear. Or if the results of things not being clear is a shortcoming of the methodology, hey, great, then use the other methodology and yeah. you already have a justification why, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yep. Okay, so has anybody got any comment they wish to make about a suitable research topic or literature gap? No, so okay, we might move on to the challenge three then. Okay, so let me then do a quick run through of what we discussed. Now, you need to identify a problem first, one thing at a time, right? So you start over with what is the research problem that you would want to look at. Then, what is it that is not clear or understood? Be very specific, write that down. From there, you ask who was looking at this earlier. And with this, you will find related studies. And with the related studies, you will also find related methodologies that you could be applying. So it's a very structured process that requires not much creativity from your end. And with this, you will also know what data should be collected and from where it should be collected, right? Because those studies have been collecting data from somewhere. They have been analyzing it somehow. And so could you. Okay, let's and they nicely give you start of each year chapter. So you're not looking at blank piece of paper? No. Exactly. Let's come into the third challenge, Jack. Okay, so the third challenge is understanding what a research problem constitutes. Did anybody have any questions or any comments they wish to make?
Everyone yes, understand? Please, please. Wait, yes, please. I wish you understand. Yes, please. Hi. Yes, by all means. Yes, my Um Is it possible? It's not a, a problem, but a, a kind of suggestion. For example, a suggestion of, of implementing a project in a specific area, which has been implemented in other area. So it's not a kind of problem, but just like an innovative suggestion. Can it be something like that? You can be doing something like that, but very unlikely, so that's arguable, uh, for a research, doctoral research project. Oh, okay. I mean, innovation, innovation and innovativeness are, are usually inherent within the research process. But what, what makes doctoral research unique is that it works over research problems. Having said that, we we were running a webinar dedicated on that, looking at university guidelines that specifically ask for development projects. Now, it, it was a webinar, if you look at our website, about doing R, not D. Um, because if you go down that line, then you need to rethink entirely how you conduct your thesis work. Because if, if you don't have a research problem, what do you then do, if that makes sense? So if you, even if you're using um, action research, there is a problem there to start with that you're working on? Yes, elsewise there won't be any problem statement. Mm -hmm. um, a research question or? <laughs> A research yeah. question would ask just to develop something, but not to research. Mm. Was I understanding that question correctly, Marva, or was the answer getting... Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. So I, I think it's very important to have the understanding about what a research problem is in the first instance. And a lot of students do not understand the concept of a problem, which is quite obvious because then their argumentation goes, the problem is that I need. Haha, <laughs> wait. Need? Need is, you know already, do you need something? How can that be a problem? So it's very easy to see for yourself. Do you manage to articulate already a problem or not? And if not, why? And, and many doctoral theses say the problem is as defined in page one. And then you look into page one and there stands the problem is that I need. So you have 200 pages where not ever the problem is even named. Check. Back to you. Okay. So did anybody have any other questions or comments about the research problem? Uh, what constitutes? No, there's nothing in the comment for the chat either, Andres. Okay, so then did you have any slides in relation to that? That's quickly, exactly. No. And Articulating a problem is often difficult, exactly. So you need to start and crafting it and develop it slowly because a research problem is something artificial. It's something that needs to be created by you. Um, even if you would start from a simple statement like that window is broken. So, okay, it's, it's clear. But then that alone doesn't show us a problem. Uh, you, you need to tell me what you think is a problem. Is, is it someone who was throwing a stone in there? Or is it because it was ill fabricated? So the material was not suitable. That is something you need to be working out. And this is something to be trained. And this source that I'm showing here is an excellent article that you might want to read because it exactly walks you through for you to build up understanding about what is a research problem and how do I craft it? How do I put it together? So. 
Okay, we have a comment in the chat is the problem is driving accidents, but it's uh, const, death and others. And the solution is promoting safe driving commitment. Now I, I, I have to smile because I'm living here in Portugal as much as Miguel, but I'm a German. So once I came to Portugal 20 years ago, I saw a weird sign at some of the streets which were telling me zero tolerance. They weren't at all streets, very rarely. So I asked, what do these signs mean? So the answer of the locals was, that means that the police enforces here the law. <laughs> and I said, really? So everywhere where that sign is not shown, I do not need to abide to the traffic law. And yeah, basically that was how this country worked 20 years ago. So you could overspeed, you didn't need to stop at a red sign. So again, the research problem, the message, bottom line is the research problem must be crafted firmly. Um, a zero sign allows perhaps to craft it firmly. Now, why is driving accidents a problem? Is it because people don't opt eye to the laws? Is it because they don't up eye under certain circumstances? Um, is it because cars are not safe? Is it a combination of those factors? And then motivation. motivation. You, you could put that motivation by driving car. In the same country where you have a lot of car accidents, which is Portugal, surprisingly, people are very motivated to separate their garbage. Glass here, plastic there, paper there. Much more motivated in this country than in my home country, Germany, where people are much more motivated once it comes to car safety. Why? Why am I driving much more safe in Germany? Because the zero tolerance is very, very high in Germany. And the police is everywhere and make sure that you apply it to the law. That makes on the other hand, wouldn't that be low tolerance related. rather than high tolerance? So, so it's isn't that isn't that low tolerance if it's zero tolerance rather than high tolerance? Yeah, well, or you, am I mixing that up? You, 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 you might, but also, also there, if you connect that to motivation, um, in Germany, no one is motivated to 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 apply to certain principles like foresight. Yeah, you. You take care. In Portugal, they are missing one important sign in traffic regulations, which is this sign that means you have priority. Now, you never know do you have priority or not if you drive in Portugal. Therefore, you always need to look into the streets. Do people come out of there? Do they have a stop sign? Will they be eventually stopping or not? That makes you very motivated to pay attention. In Germany, you rather have an accident because it was your right. It was green. Yeah? That car was not stopping here over thought. It doesn't matter. It's my right. It's my turn. Really? So you, you have a okay. apparent clear problem. Different awareness. You, <laughs> you need to, to craft it. Why is driving, why is that a research problem? How does it relate to motivation? How does this motivation relate to other things in the same or com compared to culture? So this, okay. those are the things that the research problem statement would require, if that makes sense. Yep. And given the, uh, in Australia, we actually have, um, we have multiple signs when they speak cameras, et cetera, but then we have what's called a mobile speed camera and uh, they have a sign letting you know it's ahead. Uh, then recently they took those signs away. Now there's a lot more people getting fined, they complained, so they put the signs back. Didn't really cover that motivational piece just to drive safely all the time. Uh, we have a question uh, in the chat and it says, how do I know if the problem I'm going to address will not, not give a sufficient novelty? So how yeah. do I know the problem I'm going to address will not give a sufficient novelty? That's, that's a good one. Um, mm. And there's no clear answer to it, except if it's an existing problem. 
So it still exists today. Then you perhaps would want to look into what is the reason for it still to exist. I mean, you, you could say, yeah, the research problem is we still don't have enough food. No novelty in here. We, we all could have, in principle, enough sufficient food. Yeah, so there's no honest willingness. Um, this is the reason, no honest willingness. Or there might be, be other things, it's, it's outdated. You, you look into a language that already doesn't exist. Um, so why do you need to do that? Um, so if you, if, 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 you, if you don't pass the elevator pitch, if you have no clear argument for that, um, then it's perhaps not novel enough. Other things that are apparently novel enough, on the other hand, might just be hyped. And this is, I think, a bigger risk than finding something that's not new enough. So I, I would take as much attention to hype and trendy as I would pay to not novel enough and locate your work in the middle of there, if that makes sense. I'm assuming so. Okay, so did we want to go on to challenge four? And that is determining the best time to stop searching and reviewing yeah, the literature. Yes, Akashi. Okay. Please. Akashi, yes, please. Yeah, I, I wanted to add a comment. Uh, to the question. I wanted to add a comment to the question about novelty. Yes, please. Those are comments. Yes, no mates. Okay, what I want to say is that uh, my understanding about uh, TCs is that there are about four areas that this can actually make contribution. You can make contribution in theory, you can make it empirical, empirically, you can make it uh, through conceptual framework, and you can make, you can make contribution through, through methods. So uh, these are the four areas for me you have been looking at uh, on your thesis. Are I contributing uh, through method or through theory? Or empirical or consumption. So once you're able to identify any of those four areas, you're able to make contribution from your thesis. I mean, it is not better enough. You are not expected to go and do something like to, get, to go and reinvent the way, as they will say. You know, it's not about reinventing the way. It's making contributions. What is already existing? They're about filling the gap in those four areas: the method, empirical, conceptual, and the theory. That's just my comment. And that's an excellent comment, Akashi. I mean, not that your other comments are not excellent, but <laughs> the best thesis that I'm reading are exactly those ones where the authors take great attention towards working out all of the different contributions at the different levels. By doing so, they show a high attention to detail and the likelihood that the entire research has been carried out to that standard is good. So I, I enjoy very much if authors pay this type, this attention to this different type of contributions to their, of their research to the different fields involved. Thank you. Okay, so do we have any um, comments in relation to determine the best time to stop searching or reviewing literature? What are challenges related to taking the bold decision to stop reading the literature? I mean, we, we initially discussed that there's an endless amount of literature, so you could be reading forever. On the other hand, there will be always new literature be published. So uh, how do you make sure you consider those studies within your research? And the, the simple answer is you cannot. Um, you need to take the shots and to establish your boundaries, boundaries with regards to what you're looking at, but also boundaries with regards of the time frame. Like, okay, that's today and today is the end. I will soon hand in my thesis, so I cannot do another review, but at that point in time, once I collected the data, that was the core and key literature 
out there and I did consider it. And going back to that article, I think an excellent way for you to understanding whether or not you can stop searching for literature is once you can articulate the research problem in the light of the literature. So you know the key literature to that problem at the initial point in time, what was known, how your data has advanced that knowledge, and now at the end point, end of the research proposal or end of the research, wherever you are, how is the literature relating to the current knowledge that I hold or that the data of the thesis produced, and that's, that's good enough. That should do the job for any type of stage where you are. Um, so those were the four key challenge questions. There comes the fifth put forward, but this is more interactive. Um, therefore, if you still want to get some further training, take a look at either the CSIS research proposal development course, or if you still are unsure about what is actually a research problem, uh, what is the concept of a research problem, then please take a look at the issue identification, problematizing and research question framing course, which even if you're in the midst of your research, but struggle to get things firm, could help you to, to readjust it. And with this, we earlier talked about the writing club and how useful that is. We also have a club dedicated to proposal development. And we have a new training format, which we just this year started to introduce and which we are still shaping, which are training camps. And the idea here is that you get as much hands-on experience as possible so that once it comes later towards defending either your proposal or defending at a later point in the viva, you, had had, you have had so much of exposure that you just know how to defend your work and how to discuss it from every different angle because you've done it so often. And I think this is something that should be practiced over the years because it will greatly benefit the progression through the doctorate because you can easily discuss your research with, with any, anyone and that will provide you with excellent feedback. Now, a fifth and final challenge for which I put together a brief activity is how to align the research problem, the research question and our outcome expectations. And Jack will know that for many students with whom we worked over the past years, that, that they were often not aligned. And by times, by times the students were well aware about that. And still they, they, they said, yeah, but other, other times, um, this awareness led to the fact that, oh, I now see and understand. And this I now see and understand then allowed to move further and to assure that you align those three very well. And we will look into this now a bit more from a practical perspective and perhaps using that as a closing group discussion by trying to match research problems, research questions and outcome expectations for three examples. And having gone through those examples, um, it does make a difference. You get so many ahas that come out of it because in effect, you are reverse engineering the second one to understand the research problem and the expected outcome. And even on the third one. Um, so it does give you very different insights and understanding. Okay, let's, let's do a small exercise then. Let's start with the third, with the most, Challenging then, Jack, the outcome expectation is? Um, sorry, I can't even hear you. I see which one you're looking at. The third example. 
the outcome expectation is to reduce stuff fluctuation and sure. the annual fluctuation rate of currently 23%. 23%. What could be a research question to that case? And what could be a research problem? Anyone? Shishi, you would start your research question with a why. Anyone wants to put forward or a question with why or a problem that could be related to them? Because you've got the current fluctuation of 23%. So your, your question probably would incorporate that um, the percentage fluctuation. And let's move to the, we, we come afterwards to a slide where we have some example answers that fit. Mm -hmm. Example two. So the research questions for this case are, why is the organization lacking a clear and transparent communication and knowledge management approach? Followed by, why is the organization behaving as it is, given that the reasons and consequences are rather obvious? So those are two questions. What could be the underlying problem and what could be the expected outcomes? So, for example, with the research problem, there's obviously a clear communication gap. So what else would you see as a gap? Okay. And then let's move into the first example. Students are unhappy since the university does not manage to keep up pace with real life developments, thereby providing students with outdated learning resources. So that's the problem statement. What are possible questions to that? And what is the research might be aiming for? Anyone? Okay, let's look into possible matching cases. Jack, you want, can you read through it or? Yep, okay, so for example, the first one, sorry, I've been leaning forward, I'll turn my video off. So hard to see it. Uh, the, so the first example was the research problem was the students are unhappy since the university does not manage to keep up pace with real life developments, thereby providing students with outdated learning resources. So for example, the research question may be, why does the university not manage to keep up with the real life developments? So to provide students with up-to-date learning resources. And then an outcome expectation would be, by default is to provide the university with insights on the barriers exhibiting, it, sorry, exhibiting it to provide students with updated learning resources, as well as insights on how to address those situations. So really looking at, where the research problem, what type of questions come into, but where are you looking as far as an outcome expectation? So they get the nice logic between the three. Uh, for example, on example two, you've got the organization decision-making process is unknown. There's a lack of communication loops and through knowledge is vested in individuals. Therefore, the organization as a whole is struggling to perform. So by having that communication and, and really incorporating very few, it's impacting the organization. So the type of questions would be, why is the organization lacking a clear and transparent communication and knowledge management approach? And the second question of why is the organization behaving as it is, given the reason for consequence is rather obvious. And that obviously with the struggling in performance. So the outcome you would expect from once you start addressing those research questions is to allow the organization as a whole to perform better through improving the communication loops and facilitating a share, sharing of knowledge between the staff. So there's quite a clear reference between the type of research problem, the questions that you're going to investigate and the expected outcome that comes from that. Uh, did you want me to cover example three as well? Yeah, please. Okay, so for example three, we had the company is showing an annual staff fluctuation rate of currently 23% of the workforce are leaving, which is very high. Uh, this is causing friction as well as con consuming resources at all ends, such as staff recruitment, integration and training. 
So one of the research questions for that would be, well, why we have an annual star fluctuation of 23%? And the intention or the outcome would be to reduce that fluctuation of the annual staff uh, rate of 23% of the workforce leaving. So it's understanding what is going on to be able to then address why the fluctuation has been um, very last. Okay. Over to you, Andres. Thank you, excellent. Thank you, Jack. Now, those, those are actually three real research projects. And you can see if you manage to connect the research problem, the research question, and the outcome expectation, then this is building up a consistent story. And as earlier said, what you, the knowledge you hold best at this point in time, once you write the research proposal, is very likely the right side knowledge about the outcome expectation. And this then often leads to the fact that it drives your research in the wrong direction. So make sure that you find a good match in between the outcome expectation, the research question, and the research problem. Can I see a hand up there? Up to Latif? Yes. OK, thanks for the webinar. Uh, I want just to ask uh, why we don't use the question with how. For example, the example uh, number three, uh, in order to reduce uh, stuff, we, we have to, to know how, how we can reduce. Isn't this uh, isn't uh, this is the question that we should ask? Not why, or we should ask the two, two question: Why we are having uh, an annual staff fluctuation, and how we can uh, manage to overcome this uh, this problem? Why we we don't use the question with how in all uh, in all uh, in the three examples? Thanks. Excellent. Excellent question. Now, if you if you just in a simplified form, any type of research project could include the why and how. Um, if, you, if, you, if you have solid knowledge about the why, you can immediately jump into the how, right? Then the how afterwards would be followed again by a why. So how can we do it? You come up with possible answers, hypothesis or whatever, but then why hasn't, why hasn't it been done? If you know already how it could be done, then the next question would again be followed by why hasn't it been done? So the, the why, how, and why is a chain that actually will potentially never stop. And where it stops, this is where the end of the knowledge is. Okay, okay. That would be the perfect end point for your thesis research, because you can say, okay, up, up to that point, everything is now understood, and this stays for future research. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you so much. But excellent, excellent question. So the why and how parts might be addressed in one thesis, but understand if the, if the how is too complex or if the why is too complex, then perhaps this is a, the only thing you focus on in your thesis research, understanding the why or understanding the how. And then you will come to a point where you say, okay, how is now understood till that point but from here on, I can't go further. And that then is the end of your research. That's perfectly fine. Further questions, please. Yes, wrong. Please unmute and ask a question. Okay, uh, uh, okay, I have a question related to the number of research questions we should have in a, a research proposal. Hey. <laughs> as, as a matter of fact, that comes rather down to a political question. Now, you, 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 you could have three, four, or five resources only and still have an excellent thesis, but thesis proposal, not thesis. But very likely, a, a slightly higher number would be expected. So what, what is acceptable depends on how much do you need to show critical reflection. It's not about the number of resources you bring in that makes a difference, but do you manage to show critical reflection? Do you manage to show that there is a contrasting view, that there are some un uncertain things in there? 
Now you could do that in principle by only having two studies and comparing them. Um, as said, for political reasons, likely a higher number would be needed. But, but, but what's more, most important here is to understand the purpose of using, of working with different sources. It's to be critical, to look at things from different angles and perspectives. Does that make sense? Mm, okay, yeah, thank you. There more Oh no? no? I, I have another question, if, if yes. you don't mind. Please. Okay. Yes, uh, now, now, now. The uh, I think that uh, the problem, research problem, or research question that we have here, the three examples, I think that uh, they are um, uh, for master, master thesis uh, uh, dissertation. Is there a difference between master thesis the dissertation and doctoral thesis dissertation? Because uh, I, 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 I think that the doctoral thesis must be more deep, and uh, uh, you know. Uh, I, uh, I, I want to, to, uh, to, uh, to know the difference between uh, the master thesis and the doctoral thesis uh, proposal. Okay. okay. So, yeah. Yeah. So okay, thanks. Thanks. First of all, the complexity uh, will be different, but um, also the analytics that go into. I mean, you can't. No, those, those are the two main things, the, the complexity and the analytics that go into it, that I would argue are the main differences. In practice, having said that, a lot, a lot of times master level thesis um, focus on the application of theory to something. So they are entirely solution driven, while doctoral research per definition is research problem driven. But having said that, you do have master level thesis that do focus on problems, in particular if you think about master and research, and you will have doctoral projects that are more driven on the development end. So it's not a black and white thing, but if you, if you understand a high level of analytics and criticality are an inherent characteristic to doctoral level studies to push the boundaries of what is known. Is that a tentative okay, answer? Okay, 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 thanks, thanks, thanks. And, and, and yes, it, it is well observed that those examples are simplified, but they are meant to illustrate, therefore use simple language. Okay, okay, thanks. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, we've also uh, a request in the chat is, could you please elaborate on reflection in relation to the number of research questions, please? You mean how many research questions uh, uh, research should follow? And there should be a high level question, which um, often then is followed by related sub-level questions. Um, but, but then again, the questions are derived from the research problem. And so how well can you define that research problem? How many dimensions are there? I had a student from an African country who was working on a wicked problem in a health context. Now, wicked problems means you have actually a number of interrelated problem fields, which you need to take into account. So for each of those areas, you had to craft different questions. But then again, there was a high level research question that was binding them all together. If that answer makes sense. And if not, please come with a follow-on question. May I also just uh, also add one thing, Andres, and in relation to the, the, the questions that start with why and how, um, and I also to, to ask you, you know, I, we do know that a good number of students have a, a, a problem because they focus on a solution, yeah? And looking back into this why and how, how likely <laughs> is exactly that students that start their research questions with the, how can we improve will potentially follow rather a solution-driven 
uh, approach than uh, looking uh, at what exactly the problem is. Thank you, Great, Anna. Anna. Thank you. Good. Being mindful of the time. Okay, do we have any? Yes, uh, so do we have any other final questions on this one? What we might do is, I'm oh, sorry, yes, Your Honor. Another question, please. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I have uh, one more question that's related to the type of the research questions because um, uh, it seems to me that uh, I don't know what type of the research uh, um, that uh, you just given for the examples here uh, because I think that the question with the wife and how to deal with um, the qualitative research, uh, why the what questions is uh, for the quantitative research, is this true? Um, there are a number of questions that lend themselves to certain quantitative or qualitative research, yes. And uh, we, we do have a webinar dedicated to that on record, which you might want to look at, which is about research methods. Um, but I think each problem will, will require certain questions to be asked. So it's often, often students put in a lot of energy on thinking about what they want to do. Um, but, but this is, at the end of the day, uh, not required. You have a clear problem there. You, you, you will have a tentative understanding about the problem. And your tentative understanding will end at one point. And once you are at that point, then you just need to write down what you still do not understand. And what you still do not understand can be turned into questions. And those questions might be what, why, how, when, where. But that will come out naturally as a consequence of where your understanding ends. Does that make sense? Um, my question is uh, that uh, it is true that if uh, we uh, do uh, uh, quality research, we often use the question with why and how. And if we uh, do the quantity research, we often uh, uh, use a research question with what to see the uh, correlation between uh, uh, the uh, variables. Yes, and, 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 and this observation um, is correct as such. So yeah, you do that. But then the question would be, again, what is the research aiming to explore? Uh, so all, all the examples here are from the uh, quality research or quantity research? You, you could be using either or. I mean, qualitative research is better geared towards exploring and understanding. But then there might be quantitative elements that you also still need to, to take into account. Like if you look into 20... 3% of workforce leaving. That's a huge number. A huge number in terms of, of humans are leaving. So you, you might not be able to talk to everyone. So you, you might need to take other quantitative factors into account. But then again, this will be, this means what you need to take into account will be derived from what do you want to understand. Um, because uh, because I think that all the research questions in you know, the examples here are from the uh, quality research because we want to understand more about uh, uh, not to uh, find out the uh, relationship or correlationship between variety among variables. Yes, that 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 is correct. So those questions are geared towards understanding, not to understanding better, deeper not understanding of correlationships. Yes, those example questions are. I'm not doubting that. What, what I'm just saying is that who is defining the question is rather the research problem and the understanding that is, or the limited understanding that is there, but not the curiosity of the researcher as such, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah, thank you. And in particular, 
if you connect that to the outcome expectation. So you, you have a research problem and you have an expected outcome. So what is preventing you to get that, re that outcome? What is hindering you to get to there? And this is exactly what you will study. What's hindering you to resolve the problem, to get to the bright side, to reach the solution. And this will define the question. So it's a very structured way of work that does not work over creativity and curiosity, but it works over barriers, yeah. over what is it that you need to overcome, what's preventing you to get there. Check. Back to you. So Sandra was just saying about the understanding your research problem, the expected outcome really leads to help, uh, help you identify the research question. Uh, did anybody have any final questions? What we might do is switch off the recording now and uh, move on into the professor's in.